Last week we began a message called One Family Under God, and this week we will continue that message. And I'm picking up in Deuteronomy 6 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Everybody say, One God. And after describing this one God, he says, You should have one love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. In other words, every single part of your being should love this one God. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. There it is, the idea of heart or love again. Shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently to your children. And that shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. The heart of our nation has followed the heart of most of our homes, unfortunately. And that heart is distracted and divided at best. But today we're going to talk about how we can begin to repair that divide and bring focus back to the hearts of our home and bring focus back to the hearts of our the heart of our nation. And I want you to know that it starts with you. It starts with you and it starts with me. One family under God part two. Would you ask Jesus to talk to you today? Jesus, I love you. I thank you for your presence that I feel in this room. And I pray right now that you would speak to every one of us here today. Talk to our hearts. Help us. Minister to us. Strengthen us. God, strengthen our families. Strengthen our homes. God, strengthen our marriages. God, do the miraculous children. And God, I pray that as you work in our homes, you would also work in our nation. And I thank you for what you're about to do. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And let everybody say amen. And you can be seated in Jesus' name. Seventy-eight-year-old Alita had been smoking for over 50 years. She said that for almost 49 of those years, she had been trying her best to give up that habit, trying with every bit of her willpower to quit. And for 49 years, she could not succeed. She tried everything imaginable, everything that she knew, everything she could search online and everything that was recommended to her, and she could not quit. Until one day, she finally, for the first time in her life, at 78 years old, found true love. She fell in love, and at 79 years old, Leo proposed to 78-year-old Alita. They had both fallen in love for the first time. It seemed to be a match made in heaven. But Leo proposed to her with one caveat to his proposal. He refused to go through with the wedding until... Alita gave up smoking. Alita said, I think I can do it. And for the first time in 49 years, she gave up and succeeded. She gave up smoking and succeeded at a 49-year task she had failed at. And she said this, and I quote, willpower proved to never be enough to get me to kick the habit. It was love that gave me the power to do it. There's power in love. In fact, it's been said that love is the most powerful force on earth, and I might agree with that common statement. There's power in love. Love will make you do crazy things. Love will make you do things that willpower alone cannot cause you to do. There's a saying, old saying, I don't know who it's attributed to, but be careful what you set your heart on for the thing that you set your heart on just might come true. History proves this to be the case because Thomas Edison 
fell in love with invention and we see how that worked out. Henry Ford fell in love with the motor and cars and we see how that worked out. Ketterling fell in love with research. The Wright brothers fell in love with aviation and we see how all of that worked out because what they fell in love with controlled their heart. Not the physical fleshly heart, not the heart that's actually beating in your chest, but the heart as in reference to the seat of your emotions and your will and your focus because what they set their heart on ended up being the very thing that controlled their time, their energy, their direction, their love, their, their, their work, and, and, and look at the results in each of their life. Love proved to be the powerful force in their life. Love is potentially the greatest force in your life today. Stronger than the power of the head. Stronger than the power of the will. Stronger than the power of the mind. That's why the apostle Paul would challenge the church in, in the New Testament. He said, set your affections or your heart or everybody say, my love. my love. Set your love, your heart, your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. What he was trying to communicate to us as the New Testament believers as the only way to be spiritually successful, the only way to have spiritual success in your life is to set your heart on things that are spiritual. To set your heart on things that are beyond this world. Things that are beyond the here and the now. Things that are beyond all of the right now demands that we all wrestle with in our life. And every one of us here, we've got demands on our life any given hour of any given day. But Paul said, set your heart on things above. Brothers and sisters, if I can remind you just by way of quick review what we talked about last week, uh, that setting your heart on things above can only come uh, by relationship with your creator. It can only come by being in relationship with the one who created you and breathed in your body the very breath of life that you breathe today. We read in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, and God said over and over again, and we understand that name of God to be revealed there is the name Elohim, which Elohim is a reference to the power of God or the creative miracle ability of God. But it was when God created man and moved man and woman into the Garden of Eden, this place of utopia, this place of perfection, that God desired to walk in relationship with man. He didn't want to just have man around, but he wanted to be in relationship with man. That, that, that's just in part what makes us different than the trees and the birds and the cows and the horses and the animals is because God wants to walk with you and talk with you. He wants to commune with you. He wants wants to be in relationship with you. And so when God puts man in the garden, a new name of God is revealed as Elohim now becomes and the Lord God put them in the garden. And that phrase, the Lord God, is from the original language in the name Yahweh or Jehovah Yahweh, which is the covenant name of God. In other words, God said, when it comes to you, I don't want you just to recognize me as some far distant idea of power. I don't want you just to recognize that there is a God and he's powerful and mighty. And, and, and that would be many of our world that recognize, much of our nation that would say, would recognize there is a higher being or a higher power. But God said, I want you to move from Elohim, God of power, to Jehovah Yahweh, which is the God of covenant relationship. In other words, I want to walk with you every day. I want to talk with you every day. I want to be in relationship relationship with you. I don't want you to live life on your own, but I want you to live life in connection with me. 
God created communion for us as his creation. Communion was reserved for us. It was not for any other animal species, any other plant species, but it was reserved for us. And when God created the very first family, he put them in a context of communion and relationship, letting us know, as I said last week, that family is God's idea. It's not a social construct. Family is God's idea. In fact, uh, we get ourselves in trouble when we start reaching for the social definition of family rather than the theological definition of family. Family is God's idea, and it's not up to you, me, or anybody else to reconstruct it, uh, remold it, or rebuild it. But God let us know that family, though the social construct says that family is for your pleasure, family is for your enjoyment, and I thank God that we can derive enjoyment and pleasure out of our families and, and, and maybe, hopefully, from most family members. Not all, but maybe most. Everybody's got that crazy uncle, right? Everybody's got that lunatic aunt, right? Maybe it's just me. If you say, no, not in my family, you probably are the aunt or the uncle. <laughs> it's probably you, and they just haven't broke it to you yet. Family is, 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 brings us pleasure, but it's not just about pleasure. I thank God for children and the joy of marriage and the joy of children and the joys of grandchildren and great-grandchildren and the joys of family get-togethers and barbecues and, and holidays together. But, but that's not the sole purpose that God designed family for. If that is the height of the purpose of your family, you are selling yourself short. God designed your family to be a reflection of his image in this earth. God designed us. The theological definition of family is that we are designed to be in such a connection with God that we show that connection to the world around us. That we model the goodness of God to everybody around us. That's our job as a family. And, and the family is a great place for that as we talked last week because a family is a place that if you're going to have a family that's successful, you've got to learn to forgive. You've got to learn to love in spite of their problems. You, you've got to learn to reach for them in spite uh, of their trouble. You, you, you put up with a lot of things in the context of a family life. And never are we more like Christ when, than when we forgive and when we turn the other cheek. And when we uh, forgive, and forgive and forgive and forgive again. Uh, and, and we reach for redemption and restoration. That's the character of God being revealed in our families. But it's important to note where we left off last week that when the enemy showed up in the garden, he showed up in the form of of a serpent. And the Bible says that he began talking to Adam and Eve. Look at your neighbor and say, watch out for talking snakes. <laughs> now, that would have been the first clue that I'd have been, see ya. <laughs> I mean, a snake is enough to put me on the run. But a talking snake, for sure, every time. 10 out of 10, I'm, a, I'm gone. <laughs> the, the snake talks Eve into trying something that God said, stay away from, that God said, don't eat. And so this conversation begins, and what Satan does is he, he rewinds the relationship with God back to the place uh, where there was no communion. And instead of referring to God as his new revealed name, uh, Jehovah Yahweh, he refers to God as Elohim. In other words, uh, Satan was happy for them to have uh, a ritual but no relationship. Uh, Satan is happy for you to have religion uh, that is minus relationship. Uh, relationship. Religion, I'm going to say it here, and I'm sorry if I step on anybody's toes, uh, but I'm going to preach the word whether it steps on toes uh, or not. Religion without relationship is worthless. 
if, if you have a religion, a, a, a ritual, a, 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 if you're just steeped in a spirit of religion, that's where the Pharisees were in the New Testament. Uh, but Jesus came trying to bring them into relationship. Uh, Jesus doesn't want to just be an idea in your mind uh, on Easter Sunday. He wants to have a relationship with you uh, so that when all hell breaks loose in your life on Tuesday morning, uh, he's there and you can call on him. Uh, and like a friend that sticks closer than any brother, he can help you and assist you uh, and lead you and guide you and give you wisdom. Uh, he wants you to be in relationship. Uh, God created us for the context uh, of relationship uh, and communion. And if you're thankful for that, give him praise right now. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. It was when mankind decided to live by their own discovery. I'll figure it out on my own. That they le it led them to pain and shame. It led them to words uh, like shame that they didn't understand uh, and fear that they had never understood before. And can I tell you, when you exit a relationship with God, when you ignore your relationship with God, or if you don't have a relationship with God, you open yourself up to shame and fear and regret and pain that God did not intend for you to know. But I've got good news for you. The way to restore that, the way to fix that is clear in Scripture. All you've got to do is reach out to Him. All you've got to do is ask Him and invite Him back into your life or invite Him into your life. We read in the Scripture. The Bible lets us know that this context of relationship family was created for. It was designed, it was God's design that truth be perpetuated from generation to generation. It was God's idea and God's design that the relationship with God not stay in the Garden of Eden but it would go from generation to generation to generation. That's why we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 in our text where God reminds us of this, this great revelation, this great command, this Shema, they would call it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God says, I am one. Aren't you thankful for the truth that God is one? One. You don't have to be confused about who you're reaching for or worshiping because the Bible says there is one Lord. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That's what the scripture says. And then the Bible says that God commanded them that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your might. In other words, with every single part of you, you should be dedicated and love the Lord. Dedicated to and love the Lord. Now, I know this flies in the face of typical modern Christianity, but God did not create you to just love him once in a while. God did not create you just to love him on Sunday mornings. God didn't create you so that he would have your heart for, for 60 minutes on Sunday and then you're on your own throughout the week. But God created you that you would love him with everything you are and with everything you do. And then he said this in verse 7. Thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. And you should talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Can I preach to you today that what God is telling us today is that you can have many passions, but you can only have one obsession. There can be many things in life that you're passionate about. There's things that I'm passionate about, things that you're passionate about. I'm, I, you know, some of you are passionate about cars. Some of you are passionate about your lawn care. Some of you are passionate about your cooking. And, and those of us, uh, we thank God that there's people who are passionate about your cooking. We thank God for that. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for every baker and cook in this church. We thank God for you. You can be passionate about sports. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about sports. I love football. I can't wait for college football to start back up. And, and uh, you know, I'm believing it's going to be the year uh, for my team. You know, I'm feeling, those of you who don't know, I'm a Nebraska fan. Grew up in Nebraska. But uh, I feel like a Cubs fan lately. Just hoping for the next year. Hoping for the next year. Sorry, shots fired. <laughs> 
you, you, uh, you know, we, we have passions. All of us have passions. But what the Lord is saying, it's not that we can't have passion for anything else. But we can, we can have many passions, but you can only have one obsession. There can only be one thing that you are completely ate up with. And God said in his word that he will not share your heart uh, with anything else. Uh, so I'm telling you, like I said at the beginning, uh, the heart of our nation, uh, we, we say one nation under God, but I'm afraid uh, that we're not so much one nation under God these days. Uh, but the reason the heart of our nation is divided is because the heart of our families are divided and if we're ever to be one nation under God we've got to first figure out how to be one family back under God and the only way we get to be one family under God is if we can somehow de determine that our passions are going to flow to one obsession and we're going to be absolutely ate up with a relationship with God before anything else in our life your children and your families will not buy into something that's not in your heart. They'll not buy into something that you're not ate up with. That's why the scripture says you've got to teach it. You've got to talk about it. Now, I said it last week. Uh, I'm going to refer to it again. That truth can, cannot be taught uh, until first it's in the heart of the teacher. You cannot give anything you don't have. You cannot can, can communicate anything. You cannot impart anything that you don't have. It's got to first be received by the teacher. And so if every adult in this room, I'm not just talking about parents, but I'm talking about grandparents, great-grandparents. Even if you're here an adult, you don't have any children, it's still our job as the church to communicate truth to everybody that we come in contact with. But you cannot transmit something that you don't have. You got to have it first. It's got to be in your heart first. And if it's in your heart first, then you can take the next step of transmitting it, of imparting it to the next generation. I'm here to tell you that too many kids these days, I'm talking about church kids. I'm not talking about kids that don't go to church. But can I talk about church kids for just a minute? Too many church kids these days are experience rich but spiritually poor. And, and I'll say, too many believers are experience rich, but spiritually poor. In other words, we live from one Sunday experience to another. And whether that's from Sunday to Sunday, or it skips five or six uh, weeks or months of Sundays in between. We jump from one experience to another. We're experience rich. We have good experiences with God in powerful services, in revival services. Young people just coming back from camps or getting ready to go to Nazareth. Youth Congress, North American Youth Congress, or going on uh, to Illinois Youth Convention, or the different things that we're experience rich, but if we're not careful, we'll be spiritually poor, and, and, and we'll have great altar moments, but in between, we struggle in our walk and our relationship with God, but can I preach to you today that God is not here just to give you another experience, or another Sunday high, or another good encounter with His presence, but He wants there to be something on the inside uh, that you walk with, uh, that you live with uh, every day of your life. Uh, he wants to be in communion with you. Uh, he wants to be connected to you. Uh, he wants to walk with you and talk with you. Not just Sunday once in a while. Not just an experience uh, once in a while. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that we should teach these things and we should talk about these things. Uh, can I briefly tell you something uh, that a pastor friend of me shared, uh, a pastor friend of mine shared with me just recently. There's two types of impartation talked about in Deuteronomy here. And these impartations have to be in every home. If your home is going to be a spiritual success, if it's going to reflect the goodness of God, you've got to have these two impartations in your home. The first is the impartation of teaching. He said, you shall teach these things. You shall teach. That word teach, it, it's a reference to something that is sharpened down like a sword or an arrow. It, it's sharpened down with the intention of piercing. It's sharpened down because it has an intended purpose. In other words, when he said, you shall teach these things, he's saying teaching is intentional. It's not going to be done by accident. 
You'll never be an effective teacher if you just grab out some old rusty arrow and try to cut away with it or try to pierce with it. That won't go anywhere. But if you're going to pierce, like an arrow will pierce to the inner being. I, there might be some, some, uh, some uh, people that don't like this, but I'm a hunter. I love to hunt. I love to fish and, and outdoor things like that. Uh, I just enjoy. And, and I love to bow hunt specifically. And you're a fool if you go out bow hunting with dull arrows, with rusty arrows. You've got to make sure they're clean. You've got to make sure they're razor sharp because the goal is that that arrow is going to pass into some vital areas of, of that beast. And I know before you get all your feelings hurt and whatever, uh, the Bible did say, the Lord told us in Genesis to go take dominion and conquer, okay? And so on 4th of July week, I enjoyed, uh, as we're celebrating America's freedom, uh, my boys and my kids and I, w wife doesn't so much care for it, but we enjoyed some grilled deer steaks, some grilled venison steaks. And so, man, God bless America. I mean, there's not a whole lot of more things that's more America than, than deer steaks on the 4th of July, right? But if you're going to, if that arrow is going to pierce to where it needs to, it's got to be sharp. It can't be dull. It can't be rusty. And hear me, parents, grandparents, can I talk to you for just a minute? Leaders in the home, the lessons that you try to teach them, they will never pierce to where they need to get to the heart of your child or grandchild. They will never get to the heart if they are not intended well, if they're not sharpened by the word of God. How do we sharpen them? We sharpen them with his word. We sharpen them with his spirit. If we're going to teach them diligently, it's got to be with intentionality. It's got to be with a sharpness of mind that I am intentionally going to communicate this truth. That's how the truth is preserved from generation to generation. That's how we become one family under God. But he didn't say that you should just teach them. He said you should talk about them. The second type of impartation in this scripture is talking. That there should be some conversation. Conversation simply means speaking with or, or discussing what do you do when you have conversations? Hey, parents, and I know not everybody's parents here today. Come back next week, and I'm, I'm going to preach uh, something else that the Lord has given me that's going to be a continuation of this, uh, and, and we'll rope absolutely everybody into all of that. But hear me. Or you may say, my kids are gone. It still applies because you're to be teaching some other kids in this church. You're to be having an influence, maybe even not even on kids, maybe on other people that God puts in your path. But you don't just do that by teaching. If all you do as a parent is sit down with the sharp arrow of a lesson and try to pierce their heart, and that's the only way you ever try to communicate, you're going to wear them out. You're going to burn bridges in that relationship. But it's got to be balanced with the impartation of talking. In other words, having just conversation, just talking to your kids. you got to just have some conversational moments where talking, conversation, it's two-way. In other words, they talk too. They ask some questions. They get to say some things. They get to ask some things. It's speaking and it's, and it's listening. And, and if you're not having spiritual, intentional conversations with your kids, you're missing the boat. Well, it's real quiet in here. That word talking, it literally, it, it, when you talk to them, it infers to subdue something like you would subdue a, a, a person in, in wrestling, like you would put them down. And it's through conversations and through teaching that you subdue the attacks of the enemy against your children. The enemy is launching attacks against your children, against your babies. He is trying to take them out. And the way that you stop the enemy's attack is by teaching them and by talking about them, uh, about these principles and these, this relationship idea that God designed us for. Can I tell you that, that children's beliefs are like concrete. When, when there goes a time where their beliefs are pliable, they're 
valuable. They're moldable. But over time, their beliefs begin to harden. Parents, uh, you've got to get your hands uh, on, on the beliefs. You've got to shoot some arrows of teaching. Uh, and you've got to have uh, some intentional conversations uh, be, before those beliefs completely harden. Uh, that's why the Bible says, train up a child uh, in the way they should go. Uh, I said it last week. Uh, you train children. You raise chickens. We're not raising chickens. We're not just giving them food and a place to live. But we are intentionally training our children. Free-range chickens taste good, but free-range children are a blight to society. Parents, get your hands on your children. Get your beliefs in your children. Put your love in your children. Put your obsession for God into your children. I'm preaching, I said it last week, uh, that if you just let your children float down the the lazy river uh, that society is taking them down, uh, they will not arrive uh, at anything near a biblical conclusion. Uh, And that is why we see the breakdown of our nation. uh, And it's no longer necessarily one nation under God. Why? Because it's not been one family under God. Uh, It's not the government's job to teach your children. Uh, It's not even the school system's job. to teach our children. It's got to happen in the home. It's got to happen in the context of relationship. And for those of you that don't know, maybe you're a guest here, new here, this pastor didn't come from a good home. I came from a very broken home. Never knew who my biological father was until I was 40 years old. Never even knew his name. Never had any idea about some of my family. Very broken home, divorced, lived on the street as a teenager. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. But I thank God that in the church that I happened to be going to, there were some older people that saw a need in my life and they got their hands on me and they got their beliefs in me and they put their love on me that's why it's so important when I look out across this room and I see even on this front row I I see Dwayne Lindsay and I see Don Bailey they don't have kids at home anymore but we still need their beliefs being put into the next generation because there might be somebody at home that doesn't have somebody teaching them there might be some young person or some child Well, can I preach a little bit? That's why we can't afford to let our children's ministry go by the wayside or Sunday school be an afterthought. That's why we got to refocus our efforts here because God is calling us. We've got to teach them diligently to our children. Come on, lift your hands and your voice to the Lord for just a moment. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I'm saying is, is if you don't ever turn your couch at home into an altar and a place of prayer, don't be surprised when they leave. Well, if you've never turned your living room into a place of family devotion, don't be surprised when they get 19 and no longer have truth in their heart. I said it last week. I'm going to say it again. Uh, Well, the idea today is I'll just let my my kids decide what they believe. I'll just let my kids pick their own path. And we're so ignorant in today's society. We are so foolish in today's society. We're letting four, five, and six-year-olds decide, make their own decisions, decide what they believe. Can I tell you, that may sound loving and benevolent and generous, but that is the ugliest thing you can do to your children. Why don't we hand them a hunting rifle at six years old? Why don't we hand them the keys to the car at eight years old? Why don't we let them go decide if they want to buy alcohol or, or at, at, at eight years old or 10 or 12 years old? Because they're not mentally developed enough to make their own decisions. That's why you're there. That's why I'm there. Now, whoo, help me, Holy Ghost. You say, well, Pastor... I'm here and I'm doing just fine living for God and we never, I was never taught like this and I never had conversations like this and I've got a strong belief in my life. I was never talked like, to like this at home but, but and, I'm, and I'm here today. Let me help you with something. Just because you survived poor parenting 
doesn't mean your children will. If you repeat it. Let me say it again. Just because you might have survived poor parenting doesn't mean your children will survive it if you repeat what. Well, I'm getting quiet. You can love your parents with your whole heart, but recognize, hey, there's some things that I'm not going to repeat. There's some stuff that they shouldn't have done that they did or some things that were missing in my home. That's okay. That, 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 it's okay to be healthy enough and, and aware enough to say, you know what, I love them. I'd take a bullet for them, but I'm not going to repeat what they did here. I'm preaching to our families today. I'm trying to wind to a close here, but I'm reaching for you. I'm telling you, we cannot be so quick to acclimate to the culture of this world and forget that we are required to have one obsession in our life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your might. So you can have other passions, but you better be careful what those passions communicate, and I better be careful that those passions don't become their single obsession. Well, I'm going to say some things, and we may have 87 people leave the church after I do, and that's all right, because I'm going to preach truth. We've got to be careful that the culture of our home doesn't teach our children that it's more important that they get into Harvard than to heaven. We've got to be very careful that we don't teach our kids in the culture of their home that we're going to go goo goo gaga celebrate when they win a trophy playing soccer, but we're not going to say anything to them when they come to an altar and pray. Well, we got to be very careful that we don't create a culture where we go crazy when they make the all-star team and they make some accomplishment, but then we'll let them miss church over and over or not have any regard for God in their home or no prayer time or devotion time and teach them unfaithfulness as we pursue the gods of this world. I'm telling you, there can only be one first in your life. Come on, we got to be careful that we don't grill them on their math homework, but we never even ask them, what did you learn in youth class? What did you learn in children's ministry? Uh, Come on, don't get quiet on me. I said we got to be careful that we don't grill them on their math homework. Did you get your homework done? Did you get your science done? But we never even take the time to say, what did you learn about in church today? What's one thing the Lord showed you today? What's one thing you took away from today? I'm telling you, we got to teach them. We got to talk about it. We got to get it in our homes. Jesus, help us. I'm I'm trying to hurry to a close. Hear me. Your home is not an extension of the church. I've heard it said, and it's it's a falsehood. It's a lie. Your home is an extension of the church. The home should not be an extension of the church. The church should be an extension of what's going on in the home. And that's why some folks don't know what to do at church uh, because they're not praying at home. Uh, They're not walking with God at home. Uh, They're not talking to God through the week. Uh, And so they get in this environment uh, and it's completely foreign to them to talk to God. I'm not not talking about new people. I'm not talking about people who come to God. I'm not talking about people who are figuring out their faith. I'm talking about people who profess to be church folks. I'm talking about the churchy people. We better make sure that the church is an extension of our home and not vice versa. What we do in community should simply be a continuation of what we are already doing in the mini sanctuary of our home. What we do when we're together, the worship and the prayer, and talking about the word should not be anything but a continuation of what we are already doing in the mini church of our house. 
where we learn and we become more Christ-like. And these things flow from our family to the church. And can I tell you what the church is? You know the Dead Sea? I already referenced it. The Dead Sea is dead because it has no outlet. And any church that has no outlet is a dead church. And I refuse to be a part of a dead church. But a dead church is a dead church when it has no outlet. What are you saying? I'm saying that if you look like church, you look at church like you're coming on Sunday for it just to be an inlet. That the preacher will just preach to you. That the worship team will just minister to you. That the spirit will just talk to you. That the word will just encourage you. We are looking at the church as an inlet when really the home should be the inlet. The home is our place of devotion. The home is where we walk with God every day of the week. And then we come to church and the church becomes an outlet a church the church is where I give out the church is the place where I overflow the church is the place well I, I gotta hurry I gotta close here the church is just the outlet then the church is the place where I overflow Woo. I get real nervous I get real nervous. We talked about it the other day. I get real nervous uh, when saved, sanctified, churchy people start doing just a little bit in church uh, and they start feeling like they're worn out doing too much. That makes me question your place of inlet. Because the church is the outlet where you overflow. But if there's nothing flowing in at home, there's not much to overflow in the church. But the church is the place. I'm preaching to the churchy folk now. The church is the place where you're so full of him that you overflow on others. You minister to others. You care about the needs of others. If there's a job to do, I'm going to do it. If there's a need, I'm going to help meet it. Look at your neighbor. Say, you better get this. Turn to somebody else. Shake him in the shoulder a little bit. Say, we got to be an outlet here. You know what the church is? The church teaches the family that it's more than just us. The church is the place that it teaches the family that this is where we give our gifts. This is where we give our talents and our abilities. This is where we realize that our gifts I'm not talking about physical gifts. I'm not talking about money or financial gifts. I'm talking about the church is the place that we bring the gifts, the abilities that God has given every one of us uniquely, and we bring it together for the common use and service of others. The church is where we teach our kids the principle that if one can put a 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. The church is where we teach our families the principle that, that we have a responsibility to others. The church is where we learn the principle of scripture that in my father's house Jesus said there are many mansions that our present activity is what is pointing to our future promotion in my father's house there are many mansions in other words if heaven is not going to be possessed individually then the church cannot operate with an individualistic mindset but it's a mindset and a mentality that says my home altar overflows into the church altar and the church altar overflows into every hungry life. The home, one family under God. The home has to be the center for conserving and propagating the truth of God's There was a chaplain in a state penitentiary who a few years ago did a survey of 1,700 inmates. 1,700 convicts in that state penitentiary. And he said this, out of 1,700 inmates, I found that there was only one of 1,700 that had been brought up in a home where the family had a family altar and a family place of devotion. And shortly after the survey, that man was found innocent by DNA that he was wrongly convicted of the crime. 
So out of 1,699 surveyed, none of them had a family altar or a place of family devotion and biblical discussion. We need God to help us here, church. Whether you are a family of one or a family of 15, whether you're just a newlywed couple or you're just kind of living on your own trying to figure it out, I preach it to you that it starts at home. That he's called us to be one family under God, one believer under God. And church, one hour on Sundays, I'm sorry I went long today. Come back next week. I'll try to be better on better behavior, okay? Went a little long today. But here, one hour and 15 minutes, okay, on a Sunday is not enough to reverse the tide of everything that culture is trying to force feed us all week long. And even if you're here on midweek Bible study, I invite everybody for midweek Bible study. In, in not this midweek, but next midweek. We got we got uh, uh, our summer social, and there's going to be food trucks, bounce house, all that stuff comes 6.30. It's going to be a great time for kids. All the kids get a free cone of ice. It's going to be great. But hear me. Even if you come on Wednesdays and Sundays, two hours a week, two hours and 16 minutes, this week is not enough to reverse the tide of all of the godlessness that you're surrounded by that our kids are surrounded by it's got to start in the home the church has to be the overflow of the home if we want God to bless our homes I'm telling you our homes are under attack our children are under attack our marriages are under attack but it's not going to be fixed just in the church house it's going to be fixed because we start walking with him at home somebody stand with me and lift up your hands and your voice to heaven right now his presence is in this place it's going to be fixed not just in the church but we're going to fight off the attack of the adversary because we start in our home, because we make a commitment. And so I'm praying that everybody here today would make a commitment that I'm going to start in this altar, but I'm not going to let my commitment only be in this altar. I'm going to make a commitment that's going to go to a family altar. I'm going to make a commitment that's going to go home with me. I'm going to make a commitment that's going to keep my children and my marriage protected from the enemy. I'm going to make a commitment that's going to keep all of my relationships guarded from the attack of the adversary. This altar's open right now, and I'm inviting anybody that would to come. If you want to get closer to Jesus, I invite you just to step out of where you're at as a physical sign of your spiritual commitment and consecration. I invite you to step out of where you're at or even into an aisle and say, Lord, I give myself to you. God, I declare your name.